Hey, hey, everybody. Happy Tuesday. I'm Ryan Duffy, your host, and this is episode 14 of Pathfinder. Today's guest is Barry Matsumori, a space industry veteran who's held executive roles at SpaceX, Virgin Orbit, and most recently was CEO of BridgeCom. Barry is now COO of Impulse Space, a startup founded by Tom Mueller, who was on the founding team of SpaceX. Impulse is just a year old and has about 40 employees, making it all the more surprising a couple months back when Impulse and Relativity said they would partner and try to launch a commercial Mars mission in the next available window, which is late 2024. It's an uber ambitious mission and you'll hear me grill Barry on the specifics, but I will just say that I wouldn't bet against these teams. Before we dive in, let's hear a word from our sponsor. Our reliance on satellites for navigation, communications, commerce, and intelligence has grown exponentially in the new space economy. Unfortunately, the risks have grown as well, and the need for cybersecurity around space assets is critical. Spider Oak Mission Systems provides space cybersecurity products for military, commercial, and civilian operators. Their Orbit Secure solution is the first to deliver zero trust security to zero gravity environments, protecting space communication, command, control, data transmission, storage, and integrity at the data level. To learn more about Orbit Secure, check out their website at spideroak-ms.com. All right, now let's dive into today's show. Barry, welcome to Pathfinder. Great to be here. You have quite a bit of experience across multiple industries. And obviously, you know, you wouldn't be on Pathfinder if there wasn't quite a bit of space on that resume. But you hail initially from the mobile wireless industry. Can you tell us a little bit about how you got your start and the pre-space era days, if you will? Yes. So I am uh, was fortunate. I managed to find a company called Qualcomm back in the early 90s. And there were a small company in San Diego that I joined and turned out to be a major provider of mobile phone capabilities, not only in chips, but also in IP and intellectual property and other capabilities. And they're now evolving to become a major player in not just mobile, but also processors. The semiconductor world is very fascinating, especially in recent years. I did not honestly plan to ask this, but I think it's, it's fascinating and I will actually tie it in later in the conversation, but Qualcomm is a fabulous, uh, chip maker, correct? Can you, can you explain what that means to the audience? Anyone who might not be familiar? Sure. It, this, the strict definition is that Qualcomm designs, uh, silicon chips for use in mobile phones and other applications and that other companies do the actual fabrication such as TSMC, or there's plenty of other companies, uh, global foundries. However, the part that's interesting is that the reason that Fabulous makes sense is the amount of capital that goes into a silicon foundry is so large that a company that's doing both design and fabrication, it's easy to get confused where the priority is because there's so much money going to fabrication that one may lose sight that actually it's the intellectual property in the design that's most important. And the fabrication is a secondary business to do production. Yeah. And I think you've seen Intel, some, some missteps in some of the more advanced nodes in recent years, and they're struggling to kind of claw out of that. But anyways, we don't have to, this is, this isn't going to be a a podcast about (laughs) chip makers. I just, I did want to bring it up though, because Long-time listeners of this podcast, long-time being, you know, the past two months we've been doing it, will be well aware that I like to refer to vertical integration as like the buzziest of buzzwords when it comes to commercial space. Uh, And that is, the you know, that stands in contrast because a lot of companies rely, you know, essentially on on Taiwan Semiconductor. it's the, the, the calculus is, is, and the strategy is a lot different in semiconductors, of course, but I'll, I'll make one last comment though, uh, since you mentioned Intel, the thing that, that I see, and this is just Barry Matsumori's opinion is with Pat Gelsinger, the new CEO who is very technical. Mm-hmm. I believe that Intel also lost their way when they lost the technical guidance that that company had a long time ago that really drove who they are and they have it back again. So mm-hmm. I have high hopes for Intel. Yeah. It'll be interesting, you know, in the coming years, especially given the chips and, and science act and 
again, I, these are such discrete things, but the, the, the chips and science bill included NASA's authorization act this, that just passed. So I guess that they're more, more similar than would meet the eye, but I, I actually want to re rewind even more. What was your formal education, formal training? You know, did you great, great did, question. Did you anticipate <laughs> coming into space? So, so I did things a little bit backwards. My undergraduate degree is from Arizona State University in business. My graduate degree is a master's in electrical engineering focused on semiconductor physics. And I can tell you, it's easier if you get your engineering degree first and your business degree second, but I did it backwards. <laughs> I can imagine. I can only imagine. Um, and why don't you walk us through the early days of either intentionally moving laterally, I suppose, into space yeah. or whether it was yeah. more so stumbling into space. It, like all, like all things in life, it's better to be lucky than good. And I happened to stumble into uh, my first job out of graduate school at the University of Arizona. The first job was at Gerald Dynamic Space Systems. And this is where the Atlas Centaur rocket was born. And I worked in space hired to do radiation effects on semiconductors and moved through various positions there. So uh, I, as much as I'd say I'd love, I planted it discreetly, no, actually it, it happened to be a lucky job. Yeah. Okay. All right. I, just to add some color, general dynamics, and I, I would imagine most of our audience is familiar with this, but this is a very large company. I pulled up some data, 66. Point four billion dollar <laughs> market capitalization. So, yes, so there's a lot of you know divisions, a lot of subsidiaries and whatnot. But what did you do while there, and then what did you do after? So there, I was everything from doing research and development to I ran an advanced space uh, design group. So some of the things I'm working on at Impulse Space now, I actually worked on back then, and then eventually worked directly on the Atlas Centaur program. But but what uh, if one looks at the history of consolidation of aerospace companies, it's remarkable because the entity I work for is now part of, of Lockheed and that general dynamic space systems, systems no longer exists, just as McDonnell Douglas no longer exists or all these other companies, they, they've all been consolidated into a few companies. Yeah, definitely. We, we've touched on that quite a bit in recent months and yeah. My mind always goes back to the, there was a P Pentagon report on the state of the U S defense industrial base. And there are these two graphs that, you know, for, for all I know were made in, in Microsoft paint. They're like pretty low resolution, but I always find myself <laughs> going back. I'll, I'll put them in, I'll put them in here in the video so people can see, but they just show mm. the, the consolidation over, you know, multiple decades between both for, for rocket motors and then also just satellite bus makers, uh, assembly integration, that sort of thing. And it's, it is, it is very, it's very remarkable, but I think there's, I think there's a lot of, uh, given the, you know, boom in, in commercial space in recent years, there are hopefully reasons to be optimistic that there's going to be, that there are already, and that there will be a lot more challengers and a lot more competition. I think that's a healthy thing, especially from new space. Right. Well, because you said it, why, well, how do you define or think of new space? You know, that's the term that's tossed around a lot. And I myself, <laughs> I myself don't know exactly how to navigate it. And I don't have like a, a methodology I, for defining it. I, I wonder it. I wonder if the best way to do it is in a negative and that's new space is not old space. That works for me. And before we will, we'll move on from your resume here in a second, but you, you've also worked mm -hmm. at SpaceX and Virgin Orbit, right? Correct. Yeah. So the, the club of, you know, privately held company or private like companies that have reached orbit's pretty small and it's, it's quite a prestigious club and you're, you have two of those names. So that's, that's pretty rare. Maybe, maybe less, yes. maybe less so these days because. People go all over and, and, and companies, mm -hmm. you know, are approaching talent and, and yeah, recruiting is very intense, but, um, what, what did you, 
how, how long were you at both in both of those roles and what did you work at at both of those companies to the extent you could talk about it? Uh, sure. Uh, SpaceX was about four years and, uh, Virgin, well, I started with Virgin Galactic, became Virgin Orbit, and that was about a year and a half. That was not as long. Uh, and I'll say one thing to comment on something you mentioned. What's remarkable is the number of companies and people that are migrating out of SpaceX and creating new companies or parts of new companies. Uh, it very much is re reminiscent of what happened with PayPal and the principles around PayPal. Yeah. And in a way there is a common element. It's called Elon Musk. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Well, the PayPal mafia, I think I've used the term, the, the SpaceX mafia, but yeah, yeah, that's definitely something, you know, it's a, it's on our list of, of trying to it's a longer term evergreen project, but trying to track all of that. And it's, you know, maybe that's a fool's errand because there's a lot, it's, it's a, it's a daunting task. So it's something that it's inevitably they can get mm -hmm. kicked down the road a bit, but now on to impulse space. Why don't you give yes. us a, an elevator pitch or a quick, I don't know, 60 second sh spiel of what impulse space is, what it does, what you know, issues your, or problems you're tackling. It's, it's pretty easy. Uh, first with the negative, it is not launch. There are plenty of launch companies from earth to orbit. I love it. You don't need to do that. You're making this easy for me. Yes. What we are is in space transportation. And in our case, we want to build a infrastructure that allows space to become, uh, an, an enterprise just as any other, I mean, the terrestrial metaphors or, or analogs are numerous and just as any place on earth needs infrastructure in order to thrive, space is no different. And that infrastructure also needs a variety of vehicles or, or ways to have that infrastructure implemented. And we plan to do that with small, medium and large vehicles. Uh, and that's what really differentiates us from everybody is most everyone else is just focused pretty much on small vehicles. Uh, we will do very large vehicles as well. Do you have a, a ballpark sort of range or kill, kill, um, you know, weight class for sure. Yeah, sure. So, so I think for the small class, most everybody's doing around, let's say, uh, 200 kilograms or less. Uh, lots of people are doing cube sats, uh, small sats, those kind of things. Uh, so that's going to be the small ca category of mass that we do. The medium category is going to be at about a thousand or fifteen hundred kilograms, uh, and then the large category is looking at five to ten thousand kilograms. And these are all from low Earth orbit to some other higher orbit. So uh, very capable, and that large class will be capable of doing directed geo uh, <coughs> insertions. Uh, could even do lunar insertion, certainly a Mars insertion. So lots of energy. To do. Yeah. Let's definitely put a bookmark in the topic of Mars insertion. Cause we'll of course be re returning to that. Mm -hmm. I think it's interesting. I find, you know, as, as an outsider, but there's someone, you know, tracking the industry that a popular way of sort of describing in brief, what, what one does people tend to draw analogies between earth. And so I've seen in, in impulse spaces, marketing, promotional material, whatever, what a website landing page, you describe yourself as last mile space transport. I think that's really fascinating. L last mile, you know, being, uh, here on earth, like the delivery driver or the Amazon package delivery driver who takes the package, the last mile to your doorstep or to, you know, mm -hmm. your apartment. Mm -hmm. So how exactly, what is, what is the last mile delivery drop off transportation? What does that look like in space? Let's, let, let me do two descriptions. First is last mile is where we're going to start. Where we're going to end is both last mile and in space deliveries. Okay. And when I, when I talk about the latter. Uh, again, I'll use, I'll use on earth corollaries. When a container ship shows up at the port of Long Beach, it's got thousands of containers that are coming from someplace. And at the port of Long Beach, they're unloaded and distributed to whatever destinations, uh, principally by 18 wheelers or other trucks. In many ways, space will follow in, in my prediction, space will follow the same model where low earth orbit becomes a parking orbit 
where one takes their payloads and then starts distributing their, whether it's to a custom placement or a constellation placement at low Earth orbit, whether it's MEO, whether it's a geostationary orbit, whether it's lunar or cislunar, anywhere else. And, and that, that kind of distribution model is the infrastructure that we're looking for. So in this analogy, would the, for, for the last mile, which is where you're starting first with your product roadmap, mm -hmm. that I suppose would be, you know, your courier or like an Amazon van or something, or like the, the UPS FedEx trucks would the, would the, um, middle mile, I'm not sure if you actually use that term. So if you didn't feel, <laughs> no. feel free, okay, feel free to call me out on that, but, uh, would that be, would, would, would that sort of vehicle or product, is that like the tractor trailers, like 18 wheelers? Oh, uh, what well, I, I guess one could look at it that way. It's in many ways, it's like a stage in our rocket. So, okay. uh, uh, if you want, you could treat the containers ship as the first stage. And then if one takes it with several containers on an 18 wheeler, that could be a second stage, the final delivery to the final orbit can be that last mile delivery vehicle. I I'm done torturing the metaphor. We don't, we don't need to, we don't, we don't need to do any, any more of the, the, the space to earth analogies. Rewinding a little bit, you know, impulse is a relatively new company. Your close colleague, Tom Mueller was on the founding team of SpaceX. If I'm not mistaken, had y'all worked closely <laughs> together before impulse? Uh, yes, when I was at SpaceX before, I definitely knew Tom. Tom knew me. He was head of propulsion, uh, worked together with his team. Uh, in my case, I was the head of business development and sales and uh, went through all, went, worked with all the engineering teams to understand what they were doing and also relate to what customers needed. So in my capacity, my team's capacity, uh, we worked with engineering to ensure that we could deliver the payloads our customers needed. Does that relationship look the same? here now in impulse oh it's different because i'm chief operating officer he's chief executive officer and his focus is very much on the design and development of the vehicles uh, my focus is on the operations of the entire company and so yeah we complement each other work closely that way okay so you have already mentioned that the go to market looks like what that will first look like is the last mile Delivery. Do you have an update you can share or just even, you know, just some context on what the development cycle, what, what, you know, what your initial operations, what all of that looks like for impulse for impulse. Sure. Sure. No, we've already been uh, doing work and we've shown it uh, publicly on uh, two propulsion systems and we have a third propulsion system that's in design right now, but we're pretty far along and. One, uh, one can uh, always relate that any space vehicle, you start with the propulsion system and that sizes everything around the rest of the vehicle. And that's exactly what we've done. So on your homepage, I see, I see vertically integrated. How, how are you thinking about what parts of the vehicle to buy versus build and design and develop in-house? There's, there's two aspects. One is related to the quality uh, of the build, and the second is related to price of components. And uh, the reason we're vertically integrated is, to, I'm sorry, third is supply chain. And the reason we're vertically integrated is to control all those elements. Um, let's take simple things like solenoid valves. Solenoid valves for space applications uh, can be extremely expensive if they're, if they're uh, vended to a supplier. And they may be a very high quality part, but we can make it in-house for a fraction of the cost. And that's exactly what we're doing. Right. Very much what, what SpaceX has, has pioneered in a lot of ways for the, the space yes. industry. What does the headcount look like at impulse space? And I, 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 I suspect that I know the answer to this, but where are you looking when you are thinking about recruiting and, you know, building out building on the early team? Mm. Uh, we're roughly over 40 people now and uh, been growing very rapidly. We'll continue to do so. As far as where we're looking, uh, we're looking in all markets. And so not necessarily uh, focused on any one place. I will say this though, 
uh, we have partners, especially with uh, folks like Relativity Space and SpaceX. And we want to make sure that we do not uh, harm our, our partners. Yeah. So yeah. if there's one thing we're not doing, it's looking at those places because uh, there are partners. We need to take care of them. That makes sense. I totally understood. On Relativity, Tim Ellis is an alum of the Pathfinder podcast and on the spot here, I'm actually, I don't remember. I think he was episode nine. So y'all had a big announcement okay. and we sadly recorded right before that announcement went live. So him and I didn't get to discuss it on podcast. So Correct. I'm really excited because today we're going to be able to really unpack that. <laughs> so why don't you first just say what the announce, uh, what the announcement and, and what this ambitious mission, because it is quite an ambitious mission. Oh, I think it's a great mission. And that is that uh, both Relativity Space and Impulse Space are working together to land a payload on Mars. Right. And it, uh, yeah, I mean, it, not gonna lie, you know, completely caught me off guard and took me by surprise. I think you're not alone. <laughs> I am not alone. Exactly. That's exactly what I was going to say, but what did the early partnership talks look like there? And would, yeah, would love to the extent that you can to just take us behind the scenes and sure. explain how this took shape. Cause it really is, you know, in so many ways, the first of its kind mission. Uh, it's, it's, uh, first of all, I admit it's a little bit before my times, a couple months before my time, but, but, um, this is when Tom Mueller was starting the company. Uh, Tom Mueller is a very well-known entity. Uh, Tim Ellis and Zach Dunn, uh, both know Tom and know his capabilities and they had an idea. This is, this has been Tim's idea that we should do something with Mars and that there is this other planet that we want to go ahead and develop further for, for humankind. And so they had discussions and uh, simply put, uh, they asked, can you folks do this, this part of the mission to actually get to Mars and land? And Tom said, yes, uh, fast forward, we put together, we've been, uh, working together on finalizing our, our. Uh, relationship. And that's where I entered the scene and we finalized what the mission looks like. And, uh, yes. Yeah, so what Terra and R will do, this is the launch vehicle that relatively space has, uh, they will put us into a Mars injection orbit. We have something called the, the cruise stage that will take the Mars lander and other components to Mars separate. And then there's a back shell, uh, I'm sorry. There's a heat shield that is part of this lander configuration that will take uh, the lander into the Mars atmosphere. It will separate. And then there's a back shell that contains a parachute that will deploy. It will decelerate the uh, lander. And at a certain height, it will also uh, detach. And then we have four thrusters that will turn on and uh, create a soft landing for the lander and land on Mars. Yeah, it's, I'm, I'm glad you, you walked through each element of that. Cause I could never do that, that whole, you know, journey justice in my own words, it, there, there are so many moving parts to this, even though, you know, as Tim told us, Terran R uses uh, two orders of magnitude, less parts. There's still a lot of moving parts. So mm -hmm. to make the next Mars window, you know, the, the, like when you can go, um, that's yes. that, what, what, what year is that? Is that 2024? 2024 is the next Mars window. Yeah. After so that late, late 2024. And then, and it's late 2026, early mm -hmm. 20, 20, uh, 27. Yeah. So we've seen, you know, when it comes to the world of, of civil space programs, of course, how some of the geopolitical fallout has has kind of thrown a monkey wrench in some of the, the, the launch plans for, for other Mars programs. Mm -hmm. And I promise there's a, there's a point here. I'm, I'm making my way towards a point. Uh, <laughs> there, there, there are just so many different parts. There's so many moving pieces that can basically, if one thing goes wrong, the mission doesn't make sense, you know, or, or not necessarily like you have to scrap the mission, but you have, it, it, it slips. Mm -hmm. 
So of all of the various pieces that the two of you need to put together to make the ambitious first window, what would you say mm -hmm. is relatively de-risked and what do you still need to prove out? What still needs to kind of fall into place, if that makes sense? Yes. No, it makes perfect sense. I think, I think if there wasn't a large amount of history in the number of Mars missions that have been done, particularly from NASA, mm -hmm. and that, uh, that they have tread down this path several times before, that, that we would have a lot of technical challenges uh, with no real known result. But the fact is, uh, let's take the heat shield. The heat shield is a pretty complex device. And, and fortunately, uh, NASA has a ton of experience doing, doing that one device. They've done a lot of thermal analysis, uh, a lot of uh, material analysis to come through and finalize the design. And we're not going to reinvent that yeah. heat shield. That heat shield is very much going to be based on the existing design. Of course. Yeah. I mean, proving that is the, the having that be, you know, flight proven and proven on Mars, pretty, pretty important. So what, what exactly mm -hmm. does that look like? Is that a license? Is that technology transfer? Uh, I won't go into the details of how it works, but, uh, it in large part, uh, much of the information is available yeah. and, uh, we've already, uh, we've done quite a bit of design on it already. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, I think that's probably as far as I can go with what we're doing on the design. Yeah, no, no worries. When you're, when you're thinking about your roadmap, and I also posed this question to Tim after, after we, we spoke on Pathfinder mm -hmm. and I suspect, I know where, you know, where this answer is going to go, but what would you say to, uh, you know, someone who would ask, like, doesn't this distract from your bread and butter and, you know, bringing that first product to market, what would you say to that? I don't think so. We've had this mission in mind very early in the company, uh, as well as the low earth orbit missions that we have in mind. So both, both have been planned for, and there is commonalities. The propulsion systems we're going to use for the Mars system uh, are the same propulsion systems we're going to use for, as you have, have already said towards the top of the show, you know, the Mars injection orbit, like that is in the product roadmap Correct. in sales and in BD combos, maybe later on in the decade, like having this sort of mission and this success would instill a lot more confidence in either in any type of entity that you are, you are working with or in, in sales conversations with, whether it's a civil program, a uh, commercial entity, you know, any, anyone's going to want to having, having proven that out, obviously will be really important is Mars. And I know Tim, Tim has also mentioned this, you know, they, from the outset, we're thinking about Mars. Do y'all have a similar view at impulse? Um, because there are, you know, there's tons and tons and tons of commercial space companies and it's awesome. And a lot, you know, will mention Mars or, or maybe pay lip service to it. But as Tim pointed out to me, the, like there, as he sees it, like there are only a, there's a handful of companies that actually like have it in their mission and in like their ethos. I think that. The number of companies, uh, I don't want to overplay the, the Mars part for many companies because uh, most companies I know, they're trying to develop low Earth orbit. Yeah. They're trying, uh, not as many companies are trying to develop geostationary orbit. Some companies are trying to establish uh, the moon uh, as a litter base, as a place, a destination. Some companies are targeting Sicily. Very few companies are really in their efforts making work towards Mars. Yeah. And that's one of the attractions. I think there are several companies that, that, uh, will be very successful on their lunar efforts and, and, uh, we support them, but, uh, having this capability to Mars, creating what I like to call a commercial highway to Mars, that'll be pretty amazing. I love that. That's a, that's a great soundbite for me to pull out here. I'm glad that you actually mentioned, uh, geo. And, you know, talking about other, we, we've talked about low earth orbit a lot here on this podcast in our newsletter. And we also, you know, we've, we've hit on Mars 
a decent amount just because of like the scope of difficulty and complexity and ambition and you know still the with the north star of of sending a crew there time for a short break to hear about our sponsors again space is the new frontier for cybersecurity. Spiderhook Mission Systems build space cybersecurity solutions for civilian, military, and commercial space operations. Their Orbit Secure protocol delivers zero trust security to zero gravity environments, protecting space communication, command, control, data transmission, storage, and integrity at the data level. To learn more about how zero trust architectures will revolutionize security in new space, download the new NSR Spiderhook sponsored white paper titled Space Cybersecurity, Current State and Future Needs. You can find that white paper at spacecyber.com. Again, that is spacecyber.com. We love nice and easy to remember URLs. For more info, check out their website at spideroak-ms.com and tell them Pathfinder sent you. I, I want to return to your earlier comments about orbital insertions and transfers and just those other aspects around Earth. What types of use cases, commercial applications, you know, in space services, do you see yourselves unlocking as you bring these vehicles to market? Okay. Uh, and I'll take that as a general question around kind of in space, in, in space commerce. Yeah. So I go back to, uh, infrastructure. So without infrastructure and using uh, again, an earth-based, uh, analogy without infrastructure, the whole notion of being able to provide goods and services for uh, production, for processing, for any sale, even for habitation, is going to be difficult to do. So uh, with that infrastructure, the notion of doing low cost per kilogram processing of materials, pharmaceuticals, uh, semiconductors, um, other materials, where in the zero gravity environment, it's always been a dream to be able to do processing in zero gravity because of the nature of either getting crystalline growth, uh, metal, metal, uh, or semiconductor material uniformity, all of that leads to a higher quality material that can be returned from earth, uh, from space yeah. to earth. Is, is it premature or, or is it, are, is it in, in very much in the cards to be thinking through that, you know, talking about like, uh, to return to, to return to your roots, like, you know, semiconductor manufacturing or or, or fiber optic cables, like a lot of these, a lot of these use cases that, you know, leverage the qualities of microgravity and just for, for various reasons, either couldn't be done on earth or, or, or infeasible to do on earth. But when, when you open up space and you know, the, the economics are such that it's, it's a possibility, you know, that's the, that's of course, like what, what a lot of this will culminate in. You know, if, mm -hmm. if all of the pieces fall into place. So are you thinking through those end uses? So let me, let me use uh, full of, uh, analogs today. So I'll use another one. Um, uh, when, when, uh, the U S was, was being, uh, created into a broader territory and people migrated from the East coast across the plains to the West. Uh, what did they do? They use covered wagons or other means pretty slow, very custom. And, and then later on, when the railroad was uh, put down across from East to West, uh, then all of the, the amount of, of people and goods that traveled traversed across the U S dramatically increased. The way to look at that in, in a space case is actually cost per kilogram. Yeah. The cost per kilogram in a, in a covered wagon is atrociously <laughs> high. The cost per kilogram in a train is very, very low. And that's the magic around what's happening now is the cost per kilogram of getting goods to space has decreased remarkably. The other part is reliability. Uh, again, to use my horrible metaphor. No, these are great. Um, yeah, it was actually quite bad for covered wagons to so go across to the West uh, in terms of, of the reliable nature of trying to do that journey. Whereas with the train, that reliability factor went way up and that's exactly what's happening in space. Barry, I got to say, I've never heard anyone. I've, I've heard a lot of the analogies. I've never heard anyone talk about cost per kilogram of covered wagons. So that is a great, that's, I love that. <laughs> I love that. And I mean, to peel back the curtain a little bit, I think th this is a, you know, a weekly 
interview with folks in the, in the space industry. And it's, I think of it as like a top of funnel. And like a lot of people are listening to this who might not be reading payload every day. Mm -hmm. You don't need, you know, maybe an industry yeah. or government policy update every single day. So I think a lot of them out there will appreciate, you know, you, you walking us through this and yeah, I'm not going to forget the cost per kilogram of covered wagon anytime soon. I'm, I will, I will, I'll tell you, I'll find myself returning to that again and again. So, so yeah, I mean the proverbial, the, the, the cost per kil kilogram of launch, that is a well-known, you know, that, that, that's a huge enabler for the space economy. It, are, are, are there, are there points where that sort of, I, I don't know if you could call it a law, but that trend, uh, where there are decreasing returns to scale. So, you know, maybe higher above earth or into specific orbits. And I, you know, the, the, the purpose of this question is to sort of tease out that, that vision of, of going beyond Leo, of course. And I, and I, and I, didn't, I, I actually don't know, you know, the answer, like I, I, I myself, you know, I don't know what, what the cost per kilogram looks like to the harder to reach orbits. Uh, of course it's more. I think, I think, I think the best way to talk about that is similar to what we talked about when I was at SpaceX and Elon is famous for saying, you don't fly uh, a jet from, let's say from New York to Paris and then scrap it. Yeah. That's foolish. And just as uh, they have proven now well over that they reuse the first stage because it can be reused. Ultimately though, when a rocket becomes much more cheaper is when the first and second stage can be reused. The beauty of going to low earth orbit is the opportunity to reuse that second stage goes up dramatically when you have the orbit not go so high. And so, uh, that, that I don't want to speak for SpaceX or relativity or anybody else, but they all intend full reusability and the best way to achieve it is by using low earth orbit as a parking lot. And so hence the model I described, take, take payloads to the parking orbit, reuse the stage, get the cost per kilogram down very low. And we're not anywhere close to diminishing returns on cost per kilograms, mm -hmm. uh, especially when you talk about a fully reusable yeah. stage, fully reusable fairing. Wow. You're basically flying a plane. Yeah. Re reusability. And I, and I would also add that, you know, it's, it's an increasingly important topic in space is that the sustainability, and I know that you, you talk a little bit about mm -hmm. sustainability and the use of non-toxic propellants for propulsion. When, when you're talking about, you know, full reusability of your, of, of your spacecraft in an, in an ideal world, um, you know, when, when the, the flywheels are starting to kick in, what, do, what, what, and it might, might be maybe premature to consider this, but what are the turnaround times for the various components look like? So once a space vehicle, once we have the infrastructure in space to be able to refuel, uh, do any servicing necessary, uh, there effectively is no real turnaround time. That vehicle is just going to stay in space, get refueled. Uh, if there is some sort of minor servicing, it can be done. And then if the stage needs to actually come back, then it can, it can come back and be uh, deorbited. Mm -hmm. But, but we, we expect that that stage will stay on orbit and with storable propellants, non-toxic storable propellants, it could stay on orbit for a year, two years, just sitting, waiting for service. Yeah. So that then brings into the fold another metaphor about, you know, of gas stations in space as orbit fab likes to, likes to call it. Mm -hmm. I, I suspect Correct. you're thinking Correct. a lot about gas and, and, you know, at that, at that layer of, of low earth orbit about, about refueling and, and rendezvous and that sort of thing. Uh, very mm -hmm. much so. No, we, uh, we know orbit fab well, I know the folks well, and yes, we definitely need a uh, fuel depots in mm -hmm. space, uh, and, and at various orbits. Yeah. And you mentioned, I mean, I think you've alluded to it, but you are, you are building deorbit capabilities and from the get go, does I have that right? Absolutely. Yeah. And mm -hmm. will, would that, would that mm -hmm. include sort of, you know, earth return, like payload capabilities? 
Uh, I would think so. Not our vehicle, but our customers' okay. vehicles may have earth return capabilities. Understood. Fascinating. Yeah, it's it's as you, as you mentioned earlier. You know, you you pursue a model of vertical integration to the point it makes sense so that you could control your own destiny, but partnerships and working mm -hmm. with other players at various parts of the value chain makes sense. And it's like the most mm -hmm. prudent way to, to approach all of this. <clears throat> what sorts of strategies, because I think that we've, you know, established your space bona fides, what sorts of successful strategies have you observed from the industry in bringing in new talent and successfully outcompeting other industries. And so I'm not talking, you know, I'm not talking about com competing for talent within commercial space, but pulling mm -hmm. people, pulling mm -hmm. people, folks in from like, say big tech, that's the example that I, I'll often give. Yeah. Well, uh, it's a great question and it's a very pertinent question. Uh, we're actually very focused on not necessarily bringing in talent from other industries we have, but also fresh talent. Uh, the, and I have, I have this experience also from the yeah. Qualcomm base or in the mm -hmm. Qualcomm base that one's one bringing in very smart engineers, very smart, other people that can innovate, can learn quickly the basics, but then not be held down by the bias that exists from the existing industry allows for true innovation, allows for, uh, really thinking out of the yeah. box and. And we did that at SpaceX. Actually, we did it at Qualcomm. We did it at SpaceX. And we definitely plan to do it here. That the I suppose you know it's in a way it's not necessarily about the credentials. Of course, to a certain point, credentials matter. Like having certain having certain mm -hmm. degrees, but like it's about the the hands on experience, their their ability to wow you, like the ownership of past projects or current projects. And that need not be in space. Uh, I, you know, I, do I have that right? Uh, it actually can be a brand new yeah. grad coming from a major yeah. school and that they've proven in their internships, in their prior projects. I was speaking to some, someone yesterday and, uh, we're interviewing actually for, for another position and what were we doing? We were talking about all the robotic projects that that person has been on and uh, pointed to something in the room and said, pick that thing up. Tell me about that. Because he actually built his own on his own time. Wow. That's awesome. Those are the kind of people. They do that independent of anything because they're driven. Yeah. I mean, I well, when you're talking about uh, these nimble companies where, you know, it's everyone, it's it's hand, all hands on deck, like that initiative, I... Mm -hmm would imagine is, you know, it's make or break and indispensable for success and the near term and the long term. Mm -hmm. What, and, and, you know, kind of moving beyond the topic of recruiting, but staying, you know, somewhat close to it a, a long time ago, Pathfinder two, I talked to Rob Meyerson, uh, about this and asked him about it. Yeah. Ah, yeah. Yes. About sort of this concept he puts it much more elegantly than I will right now, but the idea of clusters of, of, you know, talent density. And so LA where you, where, you know, you're based and where you're calling in from, of course, is one example, Seattle, another example, are there <laughs> other pockets of, you know, regional talent density, let's say that you think a lot about and that impulses thinking a lot about around the U.S. could also be around the world. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, <clears throat> I think you, uh, you did not mention Silicon Valley, but I'm sure you, you, you thought of that also. And then places like Virginia, mm -hmm. of course, and Boston. Boston's a hub. Austin is well known. Uh, one of the ones that's less known is Denver. I'm, I'm a big fan of Denver and uh, the schools they have there. So, uh, yes, there are some other hubs here and there, but those are probably the major ones. Uh, others are trying to rise up and there's elements that, that create that. One of them, of course, is good university mm -hmm. system. Uh, but the other is the access to money. So without good venture capital money showing up in certain markets, 
the whole cycle of innovation, innovative companies, it's difficult to start. What are your findings in it as it relates to venture capital and de deployment mm -hmm. of those dollars for aerospace startups and companies? I think it's been grand, but maybe I'm not a, a understanding the, the specifics of your question. I'll, I'll walk that back and rephrase, but there has uh -huh. been a lot more investment, <laughs> private investment in, in mm -hmm. space, you know, broadly defined in recent years. Are you worried yes. at all about yes. a pullback or any of that sort of thing in the coming coming years or do, you know, in, in, in your job and in your conversations across the ecosystem and, you know, with these various partners that you have, are, are you still optimistic? No, I, I, I think I'm still pretty optimistic and, and here's the reasons why certainly there's been a lot of money put into launch and there's an excess of launch companies. I think no one denies that where it's interesting is the applications, uh, space where, where, uh, investors have put money into either earth observation applications of some sort. Uh, let's take one very recent one that has uh, received a lot of money and that's being able to look at uh, smoke, yeah. at fires, at thermal situations across the planet. And it's becoming more and more relevant that that capability is there. Uh, so, so those applications are the reasons that space becomes more mm -hmm. and more valuable. And then building this space infrastructure means that commerce, that new companies that are focused on doing uh, things in space to make money yeah. will start rising. So uh, the future is good. Well, I'm sure you had just a lot of insight and visibility into the world of OSAM or ISAM, whatever term you want to use, but basically, you know, on orbit or in, in space service assembly manufacturing <laughs> and a lot of those, a lot of those yeah. business models becoming uh, possible or, you know, realities are very <laughs> attainable in, in the coming years. And I think that that will be, that'll be exciting, exciting to track. Um, so I think. Between now and 2024, which is of course the, the target launch date for your, your commercial Mars mission, mm -hmm. can you walk us through what the other priorities and, and, and what the, what impulse will look like in 2024, if all goes to yes. plan? I think we'll have, uh, several missions that, uh, will have already been placed, uh, by the end of 24 in. Mm -hmm. in low earth orbit that we will have done uh, at least a mission that also is looking at a geo placement a geostationary or mm -hmm. geo placement and uh, by then we may have also uh, gone and established that there are more customers uh, that want to go to mars and start building building a roadmap of customers of companies or governments that want to go to mars well, we will have to check back in closer to 2024 to get an update on how progress, how, you know, how you're tracking on all those fronts. But for now, we'll leave it at that. Uh, I'm, I'm excited for, I'm excited to follow the, the Mars mission. And I know I'm not alone. I want to close out the show with some rapid fire, uh, funner type questions that I like to ask people and. This one is not on the list, but I actually just recorded with someone and asked. So I want to ask you too. Are, would you say Star Trek or Star Wars? Boy, Star Wars. Okay. I'm the same. I'm in the same boat. Second question, uh, somewhat related, also a little bit out of left field. What are your thoughts on the age old question? Are we alone? Oh, we're not. Can't possibly be. Can't be possible. Our, our, our last guest, uh, Giuseppe, will be it. It may be an organism based on silicon, but we're not alone. <laughs> yeah, the, he, he, I'm paraphrasing, but he had a good, good way of answering it saying we're not alone, but we might be alone in that, you know, human hubris would lead us to believe that we're alone. <laughs> Moving right along. And this is, this is great. This is the most rapid fire we've ever done these. What is your hottest take? or, you know, most contrarian view on the future of space. Contrarian. Wow. Uh, I don't think I have a contrarian one. I just have a bigger vision about where space can go and the whole notion of humans and, and commerce. Uh, so 
Not sure I can mm -hmm. answer that one great. Uh, maybe with more time, I'd come up with something strange, but can't right now. Well, I'll give you some time to noodle on it before next time we talk. <laughs> okay. Last question is, will you go to space? And if so, when do you think if you have, you know, ballpark projection? Hmm. Uh, yeah, I have to decide whether it's going to be something that's a low altitude space station kind of thing. I probably will not do the hundred kilometer von Karman line thing. So okay. yes. Okay. And yeah, that's just dependent on the missions, but it, it's within, it's well within 10 years. Yeah. Yeah. I think that that would be plenty exciting, even if you don't go to the, the von Karman line, but, uh, actually last one while, while we're on the topic, do, could you ever entertain the prospect, uh, were it feasible to go to Mars? Sure. Okay. All right. Well. We have, we, we have, we have plenty of time to, to, to think more about that, but Barry, this has been an awesome conversation. And like I said, looking forward to tracking the progress of that Mars mission, but thank you so much for the time. You bet. It's been a lot of fun. Okay. That was a fun one to any Trekkies out there. Please don't add us. Those of you who watched this were treated to some visuals and snippets from the impulse and relativity Mars mission render, which is quite the detailed and high production value video. If you aren't watching this, you can find a link to the video in the show notes. Pathfinder is powered by Payload, a modern space media brand, and we're almost ready to launch Parallax, a new product, and can't wait to share more with you soon. For the time being, if you like what you heard, leave us a five-star rating and review on your pod podcast player of choice. And as always, send me feedback, constructive criticism, or your own financial projections on cost per kilogram of covered wagons. I am actually going to head out to go update my own covered wagon cost per kilogram Excel model right now. I'm Ryan Duffy signing off and I'll see you back here next week.